Author Bob Goff once said, our problem following Jesus is we're trying to be a better version of us rather than a more accurate reflection of him. And I believe that's one of the, the reasons spending significant time in God's word produces significant changes in our lives because doing so shifts our focus off of ourselves and onto Christ. And in fact, uh, throughout the life of Christ lived out in the pages of Holy Scripture, we find God's design for each one of our lives intertwined with His. It is there in His Word that we find our purpose inexorably bound to His purpose, which means there's no reality, there's no possibility of ever experiencing the fullness of happiness, the fullness of the blessings we look for in this life that we're all longing for, there's no possibility of experiencing any of that outside of Christ. And so the, the key to happiness, to living a life that is truly blessed, is actually not getting what we want. It's getting what He wants, which means us becoming more and more and more and more like Jesus. It's focusing our lives less on how we see ourselves and more on how He sees us, which begs the question, of course, how does God see us? Well, first of all, He created us in His image. And so our lives are meant to reflect His. And so the more you live like that, the more you, you reflect His life, the more your life reflects His, the happier you will be because why? Then you're living as you were created to live by God's design. That's the key to happiness. The key to blessing in this life is living according to God's design, not your design or anyone else's. It, it's, it's not doing the things this world or our culture says you must do to be happy. It's not living according to other people's expectations for you. No, it's living according to God's expectations for you. And just to be clear, uh, anything outside of that will never bring any lasting satisfaction in your life. And yet, uh, that's what we do. Because that's what most of us have been taught our entire lives, to try and become the best version of ourselves that we can become, instead of denying ourselves, in order to become more and more and more and more like Jesus. And as a result, we're constantly defending ourselves. We're constantly defending our own interests, defending what we want, defending our own design for our own lives because of what is at the center of that design. Me. It's me and what I want instead of Jesus and what he wants. Author Francis Frangipane said it this way, Christ's life unfolds in part as we learn to appreciate the gifts He's given us. How easy it is to blame others for our unhappiness, but we're only unhappy when something other than Christ has become our life. For example, the husband or wife who has Christ as their life comes to their spousal relationship already satisfied. They do not come continually looking to be made happy by another person's attention. They bring Christ's life to their spouse, okay? You'll never experience the kind of deep and lasting blessings that truly make you happy as long as you see the source of that happiness as anything other than Jesus Christ. Because every true blessing in this life ultimately only comes from one place, from Jesus Christ. It's why James, the brother of Jesus, wrote every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. James 1, 17 through 21. Now, why does he tell us to receive the word with meekness? Well, it's because so often his word offends us. 
It convicts us. It challenges the design we've crafted for our own lives. And so we get defensive about his word and we push back against it when it threatens to shift our focus away from what is so often at the center of our own design for our lives, namely me. Right? You see, God's word, if you, if you actually read it, God's word forces us to focus less on ourselves and what we want and more on him and what he wants. And yet our natural inclination is to push against that. I understand that. But listen, his word is clear. If you truly want to be blessed, if you want to be really happy, then you focus on his life and not your own, which is what we're going to see in our text this morning as we work our way through the first psalm. By the way, uh, next week, the week after, maybe even the one after that, I haven't decided yet. I'm still praying about this. Uh, but next week, we're probably going to tackle Psalm 2. We may even go on and do Psalm 3. I'm just praying about where the Lord wants us to go. But either way, uh, we'll do another one or two Psalms after this, and then we're going to embark on a whole new sermon series on a journey through First Samuel as we've just finished Ruth. And since Ruth is such a short book, we're going to continue in that natural progression right on into Samuel. Uh, but also through prayer, as the Holy Spirit leads us, of course, we're going to intersperse between these sermon series where we work our way through an entire book. We're going to begin interspersing between those individual psalms from time to time. I just feel like that's what the Lord's been speaking to me. And so today is going to be the first one of those. And so I'm going to give you some background then uh, about the psalms just before we jump in and read together. This book of psalms or songs, it's also known as the Psalter, was the hymn book or the song book of the worshiping people of, of God. It's actually a collection of five books that in Jewish tradition poetically follow the five books of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, also known as the Torah or the Mosaic Law. So uh, book one, Psalms 1 through 141, follow Genesis, the theme of the blessed man. Book two, Psalms 42 through 72, follow Exodus, the theme of deliverance. Book three, Psalms 73 through 89, follow Leviticus, the theme of sanctuary. Uh, book four, Psalms 90 through 106, follow Numbers, the theme of wandering in the wilderness. And book five, Psalms 107 through 150, follow Deuteronomy, the theme of coming home or entering the promised land. And of course, uh, uh, we know that David is best known, or at least the most recognized psalmist of them all. He composed at least uh, nearly half of them, probably many more. Seventy-three of the Psalms are directly assigned to David, and yet there are several other authors represented in the Psalms as well. Solomon, David's son, is accredited with two of the Psalms. Uh, the Levitical family known as the sons of Korah are responsible for a dozen of the Psalms. Asaph wrote another 12 Psalms. Uh, Haman, the, the Ezraite, wrote Psalm 88. Ethan the Ezraite wrote Psalm 89. Uh, Psalm 90 is accredited to Moses. And of course, dozens more from unknown sources. And they cover everything from lament to uh, praise to prophecy. In fact, uh, the ancient Hebrew word for the Psalms, Tehillim, means praises. And in 1 Chronicles 25, 1 through 5, some of the psalmists are actually described as prophesying or as being seers. And so... The point is, these are not only deeply uh, spiritual, these ancient songs, they're also deeply theological. You see, the Psalms were uh, much more than just songs for the people of God. They were and are the word of God that the people of God had at the time to instruct and inform them not only about the hope of their future, but also their ability to live their daily lives according to God's design. And they still serve that same purpose for God's people today as we're going to see in this first psalm of the collection. And at the very core of the theology of the Psalter is the conviction that the epicenter of all of life, uh, the center of all correct human understanding, the center of all uh, morality, of good works, all hope, all meaning and purpose, all love and all blessing, at the center of it all is God alone. Not God and our plans. Not God and our ideas. 
Not God and our goodness, not God and our best intentions, not God and our design for our own lives. No, at the center of all meaning and purpose and blessing, there is only God, the object of all of our worship. And so with that in mind, let's turn there together to the first Psalm and see what his word has to say about living a blessed life and how simple that actually is. And yet also how antithetical that is to everything this world teaches us about happiness and blessing. Psalm 1, we're going to begin with the first two verses. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. So this first psalm serves as an introduction, really, along with the second psalm, but more so this first one, and it it sets the tone for the rest of the entire Psalter. In fact, two of the the greatest 18th century collectors of ancient Old Testament manuscripts, really two of the greatest of all time, uh, Benjamin Kennecott and Johann uh, Rossi, both obtained numerous ancient Hebrew manuscripts that left Psalm 1 unnumbered. So in the, in the ancient manuscripts we have, the first psalm doesn't, isn't numbered Psalm 1, unlike the rest of the psalms that are numbered, because Psalm 1 was considered from very early on to be a preface to the rest of uh, the psalms, all of the other books in the Psalter. And so it's a very important psalm theologically as it sets up all of the other psalms. And it does that by describing what life looks like and what it truly means to be blessed. And most importantly... It describes the centrality of God in all of that, in juxtaposition to those who continually place themselves uh, or this world at the center of their own lives. And so it really sets the tone for the rest of the Psalter. And so that all of that should inform us as to the weight of importance uh, of this first Psalm, which begins with four very important words. Blessed is the man. Blessed is the man. And the reason those four words should be so deeply meaningful to us is because it doesn't say, blessed is the king. Blessed is the popular. Blessed is the perfect. Blessed is the gifted. Blessed is the rich. Blessed is the powerful. Blessed is the influential. No, it says, blessed is the man. In other words, the author, most likely David, says the uh, the blessed life that I'm about to describe to you is attainable for anyone. Charles Spurgeon said it this way, the blessedness is is as attainable by the poor, the forgotten, and the obscure as by those whose names figure in history and are trumpeted by fame. Now listen, if David is in fact the author of this first psalm, as most believe that he is, then those four words are all the more striking of a statement coming from a murderer, an adulterer who made a complete disaster of his own family, right? A man whose own brothers thought nothing of him, 1 Samuel 17, 28. A man who was mocked by his enemies, 1 Samuel 17, 42 through 44. A man who was hunted by his own king, 1 Samuel 19. A man whose own wife despised him in her heart, 2 Samuel 6, 16. A man whose own son tried to kill him and take his throne, 2 Samuel 15. Look, if any one of us were to experience any one of those events, any one of those single events in our own lives, for most of us, it would be hard not to allow that one major event to color our entire perspective of everything else in our lives. And yet, all of that happened to David. And here he is talking about being blessed, By all outward appearances, it seems ludicrous. And yet, that is precisely the point. As God said to Samuel concerning David in 1 Samuel 16, 7, the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. You understand what that's saying? No matter what you've been through, no matter what you've done, no matter how bad You've messed up. No no matter who you've hurt, no matter who has hurt you, no matter how far from God you've run, no matter how many times you've rejected His best for your life. Listen to me. The moment, the moment 
you turn your heart back to God, he says, the greatest blessings that I have to offer anyone, I am offering you. And by the way, the the word blessed in that verse, Esher, in the ancient Hebrew, it's a plural noun. In other words, it's referring to a multiplicity of blessings in your life. Right? And who, who do those blessings come to? Not the one who walks in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. In other words, true blessing does not come from the ways of this world. You can seek out blessings your entire life in everything this world has to offer you, and you will come up empty every single time. As I'm sure most of us have tried, uh, uh, temporary pleasures, well, sure. But if you want to live, a truly blessed life, the kind of life that changes you and changes those around you, the kind of life that makes a deep and lasting difference in this world, the kind of life you were created to live, then what you find your greatest delight in, your deepest joy and happiness in, what is at the very center of your affection and focus and attention must not be the ways of this world, but the law of the Lord, His Word, as you meditate on it, David says, day and night. Okay, your life is blessed when you delight in God's word, uh, which, of course, sounds like a very Christian thing to say and something that most of us would probably nod our heads in agreement with. But I wonder how many of us can honestly say that we delight in God's word to the point that we're meditating on it day and night. When's, when's the last time you devoted a significant amount of time to not only reading the scriptures, but then you spent the rest of the day and night, even while doing other things, meditating on what it is you just read? And listen, uh, maybe even more to the point, when was the last time you actually felt delight at the prospect of reading and meditating on his word? Because it is precisely that and nothing less that leads to a multiplicity of blessings in our lives. And listen, uh, the modern church, at least parts of it, has been fairly effective at teaching Christian principles and even certain biblical doctrines that we have become well-versed in. And we're taught those principles and doctrines over and over and over again until we're able to carry them with us throughout life and apply those principles and doctrines to our lives, even to, to share them with others. And all of that is well and good. That's a good thing. But you understand, that is not the same thing as you delighting in God's word for yourself. Actually, reading it for yourself and then meditating on what you've just read to the point that it becomes something you actually delight in doing. Something you look forward to, something you are emotionally and intellectually and spiritually invested in and drawn to. Again, not just uh, what you heard in church or have been taught in Sunday school or by your parents or other Christians, not just a set of Christian principles or a handful of biblical doctrines, but actually taking the time and making the effort to invest your affection and focus and attention into the pages of Scripture for yourself to the point that you delight in doing so. Honestly, what excuse is there for not doing that? I'm too busy. Too busy doing what? Surely there's something you spend time doing each day that is less important than meditating on the words that the God of the universe breathed out in order for you to be able to experience a multiplicity of blessings in your own life. And hear me, it's not legalism. It's lunacy that we've been given the very words of the Almighty God, and yet we cannot find the time to get around to reading them. And so instead, we rely on a handful of Christian principles and biblical doctrines to see us through. Listen, the reason this is so important is because I think a significant number of professing Christians today, if not a majority, are trying to navigate life and mitigate 
major difficulties along the way without the blessings of God's holy words surging through them to guide them and strengthen them and encourage them and equip them to see them through life's greatest challenges. Because why? Because we don't delight in God's word. We don't delight in his word. And then we wonder why we aren't experiencing more of God's blessings in our lives. We wonder why we can't figure out God's will for certain, a certain situation we're facing. We, we wonder why we can't get a clear direction for the next steps we need to take, even though his word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. We leave the lamp on the shelf and then wonder why it seems like we're stumbling around in the dark. Well, it's because we are. The truth is, if you want to experience joy and the, the power and wisdom and a, a multiplicity of other blessings that are available to you by way of God's word, then you're going to need more than a few principles and doctrines to lean on. You're going to have to learn to delight in his word for yourself as you meditate on it. Day and night, pastor and author uh, John Piper once said, when Satan huffs and puffs and tries to blow out the flame of your joy, you have an endless supply of kindling in the word of God. Let's keep reading verses three and four. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. So he continues to describe the one who is blessed by saying he's like a tree planted by streams of water, which is significant because this isn't a tree uh, that has sprung up by a stream from a randomly dropped seed by a bird or some other animal. No, this is a tree that has been carefully and intentionally planted. That word, for all of you grammar geeks out there, uh, that word is a passive participle in the ancient Hebrew, which means the planting of the tree by the stream isn't just referring to the location of the tree. It's also referring to an action that was taken. In other words, someone like a master gardener very purposefully planted that tree by the stream of water where it could grow and flourish for the purpose of producing fruit. Okay? The tree is you. The stream is the word of God that you've been planted next to by God. So that as you absorb his word, as you meditate on it day and night, you begin to produce fruit in its season, which is also actually a very important note. And we're going to come back to that in a moment. But listen, the tree that fails to ever produce any fruit is not a healthy tree. Okay, another key to health, happiness, blessing in your life actually depends upon you producing spiritual fruit in your life. All right, your life is blessed when you produce spiritual fruit. It's a fact. There's no way around it. You can have all of the talent, all of the gifting and wealth and success in the world, but if you're not producing spiritual fruit in your life, you will never be truly fulfilled, happy, or healthy in this life. Because God's design for your life is for you to produce good spiritual fruit. Okay, it doesn't, it doesn't matter how tall how big around or how beautiful an apple tree grows. If that apple tree does not produce apples, it is not a healthy tree and cannot help anyone else become healthy either. And likewise, as Christians, we can, uh, we can look the part. We can go where Christians ought to go. We can consume what Christians are supposed to consume and grow in stature and influence. And we can branch out in many directions in life. But if we never produce any spiritual fruit, then it doesn't matter how good we look because we're not spiritually healthy and we cannot help anyone else become spiritually healthy either. And I've shared this with you before, but it bears repeating. The reason an apple tree produces apples is not to feed itself, right? The apple tree doesn't, doesn't consume its own apples. No, the, the reason the apple tree produces apples is for the health of those around it, those who need that fruit to grow and become healthy themselves. And so it's not that producing the apples in and of itself makes the tree healthy. It's that producing apples is the sign that the tree is healthy. 
and also is helping others to become healthy as well. So what, what does make the tree healthy? It's the stream that it's planted beside. By absorbing the water and nutrients from the stream, the tree is able to grow as it should and produce fruit. Okay? You don't produce spiritual fruit in your life to make yourself healthy. You produce spiritual fruit to make others healthy because they need that fruit that you produce to grow and become healthy themselves. So, so your spiritual fruit doesn't make you healthy. It is a sign that you are healthy and able to help others become healthy as well. So what does make you spiritually healthy? It's the word of God that you've been planted beside as you take in his word. The Holy Spirit within you begins to produce spiritual fruit in your life. And what do you do with that fruit? You don't consume it yourself. You give it away. You give it all away because it was never meant for you to consume. And through the process of producing and giving away that good spiritual fruit, your life is blessed immeasurably because you're living according to God's design for your life. Whereas not sharing the fruit that is produced in your life, that would be like the apple tree, not allowing anyone else to consume its apples because it wants to keep all that beautiful fruit to itself, right? The apples might make the tree look beautiful and feel good about itself. But if the tree thinks that's the sole purpose of the apples, then it has completely missed the point of why it has been given the opportunity to produce those apples in the first place. Ultimately, what happens, the, the apples rot, right, under or on the tree, benefiting no one. It's, it's wasted fruit. The apples are not produced for the consumption of the apple tree. They're produced for the consumption of others who are starving and need its fruit to be fed and to grow and to become healthy. That is the only reason the apple tree produces apples to feed others. You, you understand the reason you have been given good gifts, spiritual fruit in your life is for you to give it away to feed others the truth of the gospel, to make disciples, to build up his church. But if all you ever do is feed on God's word and grow and produce fruit without ever sharing that fruit with others, it doesn't benefit you or anyone else. And eventually that fruit becomes rotten and it blesses no one. Okay, if you want to be blessed, then you must be a blessing. And the greatest blessing you can ever be to another human being is not by sharing your talent with them or your charisma or your personality or your friendliness. No, it's by sharing the spiritual fruit that God has given you. And I just want to say one more thing about spiritual fruit because the psalmist says the tree yields its fruit in its season. Okay, the apple tree doesn't produce apples 365 days a year. There are seasons when the apple tree is producing fruit and there are seasons when the tree is not producing fruit. It, it's still being nourished. It's still absorbing what it needs to continue to be healthy, but for a period of time, it produces no fruit. Listen, none of us can produce fruit for others 365 days a year year after year after year. We cannot. I've tried. I'm sure many of you have as well. It is impossible because producing fruit for others to consume around the clock, nonstop, without a season of personal spiritual replenishment, that is not God's design for your life. There are seasons when you have to be fed you have to absorb what you need to continue to be healthy while not producing fruit for others so that when the time comes, you're able to produce the fruit that others need from you. So just hear me. Don't beat yourself up if you're in one of those seasons of life. The fact is we all need them to stay healthy, but it's also important you understand uh, that's not the time to pull back from the stream right? That's when you need the health of the stream more than ever. And so when you find the spiritual fruit in your life drying up, that's when spending time with those who feed into your life, that's when your time in God's word, that's when your prayer life, that's when meditating on the word of God with the help of the Holy Spirit, that's when all of that needs to intensify. That's when you, you drink even deeper from the stream. Those are the times more than ever that you focus on Jesus. As he said, I'm the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. 
for apart from me. Right? When you pull back away from the stream, you can do nothing. John 15, 5, you see that season of not producing fruit is not meant to be a spiritually dormant season in your life. It's also not meant to be permanent either. No, it is a season in your life, a limited period of time for you to grow and become replenished so that you can start producing fruit again in season, which as uh, taxing as that can be at times, it is also one of the greatest source of blessings you will ever experience in your entire life when you bless others with what God has given you. Pastor and author Jack Hiles once wrote, the greatest blessing in the whole world is being a blessing. And by the way, uh, that statement is true regardless of how the fruit you produce, listen, is received by others. Okay? Author Ed Cole says it this way, after giving something to God, you are no longer accountable for it. Your blessing is based on your giving, not on what others do with the gift. All right, let's finish the psalm for today then, verses five and six. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. There are two different groups of people described here. Those who are known by the world and those who are known by God. And to know someone, at least as it is described here, in verse 6 of the ancient Hebrew, it's the word yada. It means uh, far more than simply being informed about a person. It is actually an intimate knowledge of every aspect of their life, as we see in Psalm 139, 1 through 6. Uh, it is to care about them deeply, as we see in Psalm 31, 7 and Hebrews 8. And it is to own or completely identify oneself with, as we see in Proverbs 3, 6. Okay, uh, this word yada. To know is to be in deep relationship with the knower, Jesus Christ, which is where all blessings in our lives ultimately come from, right? Out of a relationship with Christ. Okay, you're blessed when you're known by God, which, again, I understand. It seems like an obvious thing to say to a room full of Christians, and yet in practice, this truth seems to elude a lot of believers, the fact that all, all true blessings in your life ultimately only come out of a, a relationship with God. And yet, if we honestly believe that, then why do we continue to search for deep blessings that we all long for in relationships and things outside of Christ and what He offers us? But that's exactly what we do. And listen, uh, the dysfunction in doing that is the fact that we're expecting other people specifically in this world in general to provide for us what only God is able to provide. And look, the, the result of doing that is frustration and unhappiness and broken relationships and disillusionment with life and family and friends and the church and our jobs and the things we own and amass all the people and things we're so convinced will make us happy. Yet they all come up short because we're looking for those people and those things to provide for us something that can only come from God. Which brings us back to where we started. True, lasting, unshakable happiness, joy. It can only be found. It can only be found in Christ, not in your spouse, not in your family, not in your job, not in your church, not in your things. You understand, those can all be tremendous blessings in your life, of course, as long as you're able to recognize and acknowledge through an active relationship with Christ, the source of those blessings, which is Him, Christ alone. It's coming from Him. Otherwise, you will look to those people and those things as blessings on their own merit. And I'm telling you, that will leave you wanting every time. It's exactly why so many people, I'm talking about Christians, are unhappy with their lives today because they're looking to people and things to fulfill them, to make them happy instead of turning to Christ for that fulfillment and happiness 
that only he can ultimately provide. They're, they're trying to live their lives according to their own design, based on what they value most, rather than living their lives according to God's design, based on what he values most. And then, and then when they ask you to help them work through their unhappiness, their struggle, and you point out to them that Jesus and what he wants has to come before themselves and what they want, they become defensive. They try to defend themselves and defend their own interests and defend what they want. They defend their own design for their lives because they're trying to protect what is at the center of that design. Me. It's me and what I want instead of Jesus and what he wants. And if that's you today, I'm telling you out of no other motivation other than love, until you can admit that to yourself and most importantly to God and turn yourself and everything in your life over to him and what he wants, until you do that, you will never find lasting happiness in this life. And yet the moment, the moment you turn everything over to God, he says, the greatest blessings that I have to offer anyone, I'm offering to you, which is the key to living a blessed life. It's turning our gaze away from self and the selfishness of this world and fixing our hearts on Christ alone, the source of every single blessing. Let's pray.